Okay, so hello everyone. This is our Teaching with Digital Humanities workshop uh, with myself, Brittany O'Neill, Humanities and Social Sciences Librarian, and... I'm Leah Duncan Powell. I'm the Digital Collections Librarian. So our goal today is to go over some of the basics of teaching with digital humanities, um, what that means, and some examples of what tools and sort of activities that you might use if we did this. So to start out, we've got our broad overview of what is digital humanities. So we've got the definition here of digital tools and methods to do work in the humanities at any point in the scholarly and creative life cycle. So that's using digital methods to gather and analyze data, that could be data visualization, it could be content or text analysis, anything that uses a digital tool at some point in the process. And it tends to be interdisciplinary and it's a sort of move away from traditional methods of humanistic work and working away from the printed word, um, maybe using the printed word, but moving into a way that uses digital tools to approach humanistic inquiry. And this tends to go really well um, because of the critical thinking skills that are applied when you have to use these digital tools that it plays in really well. So how can it be used in teaching? Um, in addition to scaffolding students engagement with the text you are teaching, from a data literacy standpoint, using digital tools to build and interpret meaningful data, um, in this case, I think we're talking mostly about textual data, uh, requires students to um, make their own responsible decisions about how they're using their own data and to have some hands-on insight into the fact that data is never raw, it's always manipulated, um, it's always interpreted, um, there's always decisions made about which data to select and use. I also find that working with text as data often requires students to deconstruct and defamiliarize the texts that they're working with. Um, and sometimes that, that process of defamiliarization and deconstruction of looking at the text in a new way leads students to read the text more closely. Um, to have new insights about it. Uh, so digital text analysis tools, um, a principle for me is that they almost always work best alongside traditional methods of reading. Um, they support those methods rather than replace them. You might use digital tools to, to sort of distance read or analyze a corpus of texts that is too big for you as a human with a limited amount of time and resources to read, um, but even so you would want to be reading sort of samples of that corpus to uh, have a sense of what's going on in it beyond what a machine could tell you. So I think I'm going to pass it to Brittany. She's going to show an example deliverable of an online exhibit using night lab tools. Yes, I am. So I'm going to be going over a project that myself and Marty Miller, our art librarian, put together on the Battle of Baton Rouge. It's sort of a digital exhibit that uh, was created for the Gulf South History and Humanities Conference a few years ago uh, to show what a product might look like if you apply DH tools to teaching. So I'm going to pop out of my screen share here, if it'll let me. There we go. So to show you a little bit of what it looks like, we created this in uh, LibGuides, but this could be created in a million different sort of web publishing formats, WordPress, something like that. Uh, and this project includes resources from multiple different places. So the idea being that oftentimes a normal sort of traditional research output for students would include lots of different kinds of resources from lots of different kinds of places and providing some context um, for that. So we have images from uh, books in our collection. We've got a, a tool here. This is a tool from Night Lab, which I'll be going over later, called Juxtapose that allows you to put images side by side to compare them. So we have a, an image 
from the 1860s of the Mississippi River from Baton Rouge. And then we've got the current day image courtesy of Marty when she went out to the river to take a similar shot. Uh, and we use several tools to kind of tell the story of this battle. This is one of the ones I'm gonna be going through. Um, and this is using Story Map. So it's a tool that allows you to use multimedia and Google Maps in order to tell your story. So we've got all kinds of data that we've pulled from the Louisiana Digital Library, from uh, special collections in print, from our print collections, from databases, from stuff that's freely available on the web, uh, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And then we have another juxtapose that I think is a little bit more effective. Um, that shows a map of the Battle of Baton Rouge, and we have overlaid it with a Google Earth view of what Baton Rouge looks like now. So you can see where each of these sort of infantries were uh, battling. So you can see that there's a big red rebel forces going over Magnolia Cemetery. So I'm already got some great images of Magnolia Cemetery and the plaque that's out there about the Battle of Baton Rouge, uh, as well as lots of other tools in here. I'm not going to go through the whole guide, but uh, these were all created with Night Lab tools, which are really great because they are um, very lightweight. So Night Lab is a project from Northwestern that creates these sort of digital tools that you can use to tell a story. Oftentimes journalists have started using them. Um, and it is great because it's open source, it's really adaptable. And these tools are mostly based off of the Google suite of products. So things like Google Docs and Google Maps. So they're very easy to use for students who already know how to use Google very easily. So I wanna show you two in particular. We can go through them pretty quickly because they're so lightweight. Um, we already have an example of what they look like. But the first one I'm gonna use is Story Map. So Story Map is a way of telling stories using Google Maps and it includes lots of different options for multimedia that you might include to tell that story. They're really great because they give you very step-by-step -step directions on how to use it. But I'm gonna pull up what one of mine looks like. So this is one that is on the guide and you basically drop a pin on Google Maps for each individual piece of the story. So this particular one was uh, the Confederates coming to Baton Rouge for the battle from Vicksburg. And for each of these, I put in an image, you drop your coordinates or your address, you provide some context, you can put in citations. This is an image from a book that we have in the collections. Um, and then as you go through each of your map points, you drop your pin. I have lots of different kinds of multimedia in here. And you just go through and add whatever context that you need. You can also add more than just images. And then once I publish it, I basically just get an embed URL in story maps that I can publish anywhere that I wanna publish it. So you could pop it into a WordPress site or Omeka or whatever you decided to publish with. Very, very easy to use. That's the long and short of it. You just kind of put in your information and it's great because it gives a, a place to put citations for a, a student that was doing this for a research project. And then we also have timeline, which let me go back to the night lab page. So timeline does a very similar thing, but rather than mapping, it's for time uh, where you can create a timeline. And basically when you create something, it just creates a copy of a Google sheet that you can input your data in. So here's an example of a timeline that they have where you can include all kinds of different media to go through time. So you can include images, you can include Google Maps, you can include videos, audio, um, Wikipedia articles, all kinds of stuff that you can put in your little places in time. So when I make my copy, this is what it looks like. It's just an open Google sheet that I can put in my data for. So I pick the dates. You can be as broad or as narrow as you need. So you could pick just a year. You could go as specific as a time um, or a time period. So do a beginning and end date. You add a headline to uh, stamp on your 
timeline, as well as some text that goes with it, any media that you want to add, mine are all Dropbox links of images. Um, and this includes, uh, we've got some from uh, Civil War newspapers database, some from Hill Memorial, we have some from uh, the LDL through the East Baton Rouge Parish Library archives, and then I can provide my captions. And then all I do from there is I do my file and publish to the web. And once I do that, I copy it into the timeline, go down and make a timeline. I get my template, I publish it to the web, and then I just paste my URL in there, and then I get my timeline just as I've published it. So these are all really, really easy to use, which is why I think that they're very helpful um, for really low barrier to entry research assignments because students can accomplish them pretty quickly, but it does provide them a different kind of output of what their research might look like and maybe get them thinking a little bit more about how resources interconnect because they're seeing them sort of visually. So those are the two tools. Night Lab has tons of others. They have some for um, including audio within text. They have uh, the juxtapose where you can look image by image. There's lots of really very easy to use tools. So I'm going to shut my mouth about all of that. <laughs> There's a lot of, lot of stuff we could do with that. But I'm gonna go back to Leah. Okay. And I will allow you to share mm. your screen. All right, so I'm going to start with a quick overview of the Louisiana Digital Library um, because there are a lot of collections and resources here that you can use alongside these digital tools. Um, the Louisiana Digital Library provides you with free online access to digitized historic materials um, held at archives across the state. Um, so we've got between 25 and 30 contributing institutions in Louisiana at this point. Um, so you can search these materials, you can search across the entire library, you can browse by institution. Um, we've got some subject guides for you. I'm going to start just showing you a few ways to access our materials um, in the digital library. Uh, less because I think people uh, attending right now or watching that video need a lot of search tips, but more to highlight things you might want to go over with students um, were you having them use this as a resource. Um, so up here, of course, I can search the entire library. So I'm going to search Huey Long as an example. And you see that this gives us over 45,000 results. Um, that is likely to be pretty overwhelming for anyone, especially students. So we need to find a way to do, narrow these results down. I'm gonna see my screen side, there we go. Um, we're getting so many results because this search is showing us every item with the word Huey and every item with the word long along with all the items that have Huey Long. So one easy way to narrow this down is by using some Boolean search strategies. So I can search Huey and Long. Um, that's going to narrow down to the items that have both of those words. And now we're getting 1900. So it's a little bit easier to work with. Um, you can also teach students to use quotation marks to do more specific searches. So if you actually wanted information about the Huey Long Bridge rather than Huey Long, the governor, we could use quotation marks and search for Huey P. Long Bridge. And that's giving us 115 items directly related to the bridge. If we wanted pictures or items related to the construction of the bridge, you can look at the subjects over here um, and one subject with 14 items is construction. So if I click on that, I'm getting largely photographs of the bridge being built. You can also search by institution. So this is especially useful if you just wanna browse. So if I go back to the home page and scroll down, we have this gallery of our contributing institutions. Um, so let's see, I'm interested in what the Historic New Orleans collection has. These are all the collections contributed by the Historic New Orleans Museum. Um, let's see, maybe I want to 
I could either search across all of these collections here, or I could go a step deeper, look at the dark decorative arts of the Gulf South. I could search specifically within this collection. Maybe I wanna see lamps <laughs> of the Gulf South. I could search for that. That's gonna take a second to load. So I'm just gonna let you take my word for it that that will pull up <laughs> images of lamps in this collection. The last sort of search tool I wanna to show you, here's our lamps, is if you go to the about page for the LDL, we have some resources. And one resource we have are these subject guides. So these guides were curated by professionals at institutions across the state. Um, they are guides to uh, research topics that are popular among LDL users and topics that are just highly represented in the LDL. Um, so you see we've got Huey Long, Mardi Gras, the Mississippi River, and these guides. So here's the guide to the environment. They Some of them will have search results already narrowed down for you. So it'll lead you to a search result page. Um, it might lead you to a specific relevant collection. It might lead you to a um, particularly relevant item. So this is a variety of um, types of sources. They are not exhaustive, but they are sort of highlights of these particular topics. Um, so this is a place you could direct students to for getting started. Um, so that's sort of, that's, that's the overview of the LDL. So now I'm gonna transition into a way that you might lead students through using these collections as data, um, specifically in this case, textual data. Um, and more specifically, I'm going to show you how you could guide students to use our daily route daily Reveille collection, which holds digitized issues of LSU's student newspaper from 1959 to 1975. Um, I have worked with some specifically English 2000 classes um, that I know a lot of instructor, inst instructors lead their students to research topics that are relevant to LSU specifically, maybe problems at LSU, um, issues at LSU. And the Daily Reveille collection can be particularly helpful in helping students sort of historicize those LSU specific topics, whether you know it's parking at LSU or um, student fees at LSU, you can see how these topics were being written about by students in the mid-century. Um, just to like provide that sort of timeline. Before I get right into the Daily Reveille, however, this is a big collection. I mean, there's hundreds of issues. I am going to show you a way to help students manage these digital sources um, because they, again, it can just be really overwhelming when you're clicking through websites, you're not keeping track of them, you don't have a physical item on your desk. Um, so I recommend introducing students to Zotero before you even get them diving into digital collections very deeply. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Zotero. It's a citation management tool. It allows you to create your own collections and a collection is just like a folder. And then you can add items to this collection by hand. It'll ask you what type of item you're adding. So let's say we're adding a newspaper article. And then it's giving you information fields so that you can collect the relevant metadata, the relevant information about these um, sources for your research, title, author, a URL to connect, et cetera. Perhaps even more helpful about Zotero is you can install the Zotero connector, which is an, it can be a, a Chrome extension. Um, I think it connects to another browser too, either Safari or Firefox, I can't quite remember, but it can be a Chrome extension. And then when you're looking at 
a, a online article, you can just click the connector and it will automatically save that source with the metadata into your own Zotero folder. So it just does that automatically so you can keep track of things. Really helpful um, for helping students stay organized in their research. Let me go back to my other screen. Okay, so to get to the Daily Re Reveille collection, I could of course search for it up here. I'm going to go to it step by step just to show you where it's situated. It's an LSU collection. It is in LSU Libraries Special Collections. And here it is, Daily Reveille Newspaper Collection. Um, so here, again, I could search all of the text of all of the digitized issues. Um, if I go into this thumbnail, it's going to give me a calendar view of every issue. So if you wanted to start to see a little bit more generally by date, what's going on in 1965, what issue was published on your birthday in 1970, um, you could find that. That's taking a second to load. So I'll let that do its thing. And I'm gonna go back over here because I'm actually just going to search the entire collection. And I'm going to search library. So this is gonna give me a sense of what have students been writing about the library from 1959 to 1975. So these search results are showing me every page of the digitized issues that mention the word library. Um, so I'm going to open up this one. And so here's an issue that talks about the library. I can go to this details tab and it's showing me what volume am I looking at? What issue am I looking at? What is the date published of this issue. So that's just a quick overview of where we actually are. I will say this hasn't been working today, but normally you would be able to click on the issue and it's going to bring up this image viewer. And on any other day, a really cool feature of this image viewer is that it will flag. So in the way that there's this little marker for page one, it would have a little marker on every page across the slider that mentions the word library already marked for you. And then you would be able to go to that page and the word library will be highlighted. So you don't have to read the whole issue to find out what was the relevant information. And then when you are at that, um, at that article that talks about the library, you can click on view text only and this is bringing up the plain text of that page. This, this plain text was generated by a machine, generated by software. Um, the, these were not hand transcribed. So there's gonna be some, a little bit of funkiness. Uh, the software that will read it, will see maybe an image or a border or just a, you know, a mark on the original and it might interpret it as some funny characters and dashes. But for our sake, doing text analysis, this really doesn't matter um, because what we need for text analysis is really just a bag of words <laughs> that we can make meaning out of. Um, we're not reading it in a linear fashion. So the formatting or sort of meaningless characters for the most part don't matter. So I had done my search for library um, and knowing the image viewer wasn't working today, I pulled up images of the articles that we are gonna be looking at in this demonstration. So this is an article from 1959 that is about the opening of the main library. Um, it is, it's, it has a very celebratory tone 
Um, it's very hopeful. It talks about the library providing a quiet space for students to, um, I think it says, contemplate the complexities of the world. Um, so it's, it's hopeful. It's going to be a premier research institution. It's celebratory. The next article we're going to be using in text analysis is from 1973. This is Funding Problems, the Library, Endangered Species. Um, so clearly you can tell from the headline, the tone here is different. This is about funding problems. Um, it's about, you know, unfortunately, recent trends in funding indicate that the library may lose its luster. <laughs> um, so in the, the 14 years from 59 to 73, the writing done about the library is changing and we can already see that. So what do I do in this text analysis process is I would ideally go to this page. I would go to view text only and I would copy and paste this text into a, a plain text processor. I would not recommend using something like Word or Google Docs because that adds a lot of formatting that we don't need for text analysis. I would instead use um, either Notepad if you are on a PC or um, you know text edit if you're using a Mac. I'll go ahead and change my screen too. So I would paste the text into an editor. This is not the relevant text, this is just an example, but we can see just skimming through if we were gonna do some basic data cleaning. I'm skimming through to see if there's sort of repeated um, additions to our textual data here that might prevent a machine from understanding what these words are. And one thing I see is this dash and space. Um, this occurs frequently throughout these articles because it's, I mean, you know why it's the end of a line. But this is going to prevent a program from understanding that this word is saying. And it's going to make it think that there's one word say and one word ing. So a really simple cleanup we can do with this data. And I would recommend doing this with students so that students understand that, you know, data is manipulated, data is cleaned. It doesn't just fall in your lap ready to use. Um, is I can do a quick replace of this dash in space and replace it with nothing, replace all. And that has cleaned up that problem. And that's the main problem I see here that's going to prevent us from seeing anything meaningful about this. So I would do that cleaning process. Now I'm going to Close that window. I'm going to share my screen again. Once I had my two text files um, cleaned up and ready to go, I would go to Voyant Tools. Let me start a new session because this is one I was already working on. So Voyant Tools is a suite of text analysis tools. Um, it does a lot of different things. It's, it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, but it's free, it's online. And to get started here, I could paste full text into this text box. I could paste the URLs or I can upload the um, text files I wanna work with. So I already have my text files ready to go and I can upload both of them at the same time. So I've got my article about the opening of the library, the celebratory 1959 article and I have my 1973 article about um, the funding problems. Now, all of these panels are giving us different types of visualizations. Um, this can be a little overwhelming to first look at. These are all doing slightly different things. There's lots of documentation. You could read about these various tools. These panels are resizable. So I'm gonna direct your attention to this lower left, which is a summary of the, the two documents we've uploaded. Um, 
So we've got some, some different information. We've got the length of each document. We've got the vocabulary density. We've got average words per sentence. I'm not surprised that the, the sentence length and vocabulary density in this case is quite similar in that they're both uh, student newspaper articles. You would expect the style to remain similar. We have most frequent words across the corpus. So it's not surprising that the most frequent words in these two articles are library, university, and books. But what I really want to look at is this distinctive words. Um, so distinctive words is a it's a it's a quantitative statistic. Um, it's it's using a certain formula that's showing you the words that are the most unique to the 1959 article meaning the words that occur relatively often in the 1959 article, but infrequently in the 73 article. Um, so it's, it's a ratio and it's balancing those out. The distinctive words for the 73 article is gonna show you words that are occurring a lot in the 73 article, but not a lot in the other. So it's for two articles about a, the same topic, about the library, it's gonna highlight the different perspectives in those two articles. Right now, this is only showing us five words, but I can go to this little item slider right here. And I'm gonna move it up to 40, so we just get a little bit more information. So we can see in the 1959 library opening, we have words like dedication, education, um, honorary, centennial, attractive, um, leadership, introduced, inspire, important. So you're seeing here this sort of celebratory, hopeful tone. We see in the 1973 article where it's like problems, uh, funding, financial, budget, sufficient, south, research, problem, um, unfortunately, trends. So again, you're seeing this tone that is about financial problems. So this can be used, your students can use this in their arguments um, as textual data. If they were historicizing, you know, a, a research paper about library funding to show, you know, in 14 short years, sort of how perspective has changed on the library from 59 to 73. Um, and you could, you could connect to that to whatever your current argument is or the current research you're doing is. So that provides that, um, you know, this problem or the, this topic isn't, isn't brand new, you know, in 2021, students have been thinking about it. Um, and that can be a part of an argument. I'll show you really quickly, one other tool that it does the same thing and it just has a different layout. It's a little bit, this tool is more designed to be student friendly. Um, it's accessible to even high schoolers and middle schoolers, um, but it, it provides less information than Voyant, but it's a little easier to look at. So this is same diff. With same diff, you can also upload your files. It only lets you upload two Whereas with Voyant, you could upload as many as you want. So I'm going to upload these same articles and hit compare. And this is in the middle is again the the words frequently used in both in both articles. So library, university, state, LSU. And then on the left, we've got words. It's not, it says words that are only in the 1959 article. That's not quite true. It's, it's just words that are um, used a lot more in the 1959 article than the 73 article. And this is the exact same algorithm that Voyant calls distinctive words. So we're getting the same list of words. It just is aesthetically different. Um, if this felt a little bit more approachable to you in teaching or you just wanted to sort of focus on this one tool and then over here, we've got the 73 article. It's the same list of words. So that's Voyant. That is databasic.io. Um, we have 
a lot of collections on the LDL that provide textual data that you could use. We also have collections that provide geographic data, um, collections that are probably provide various quantitative data that are accessible. I think at this point, I'm going to pass it back to Brittany. She's going to talk about uh, some of the ways we can support you. Perfect. Yeah, so I am going to share my screen. So let me jump ahead here. So we are going to talk a little bit about how you can learn more and get some support. So we have a teaching with DH guide that Leah and I put together because we only went through uh, four tools, but there are uh, frankly like thousands more that you could probably use. Uh, so I'm going to pull up, see if it'll let me pull it. Let's try this again, see if I can pull up the screen. Perfect, there we go. So. This is our guide at the very easy friendly URL is it's guides.lib.lsu.edu slash DH. Uh, but this is a research guide that we put together that gives you some opportunities to learn more and get support if you need it. So on the homepage, it has a little bit more about DH as well as some books from our collections and journals from our collections that you can sort of learn more about and maybe some more um, niche areas of digital humanities. So we have some specifically on data feminism. I'm very excited to read that book that I just bought, um, as well as uh, like algorithms of oppression, um, programming in DH and past play, which is about DH and history. Um, so there's a lot of really good further reading on there if you wanna um, dig your teeth into it. We also have some other example projects. So I know that Leah showed a little bit about how you would use the LDL and I showed a little bit about how you might use lots of different kinds of resources. But if you need um, some sort of visuals for what a project might look like in order to envision it, we have some examples, both from projects that have been done at LSU and then other example projects and other specific curricular things. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have uh, the Battle of Baton Rouge that I showed you, as well as some example projects from the Digital Scholarship Lab, like the digital edition of the Broadway Journal or Go Shakes for Shakespeare related materials at Hill. Uh, so we've got lots of information there. In the middle, I have some example projects from outside of LSU. I wanna show really quickly one that I think is very cool, uh, that there are ways that you can use these tools in ways that you might not think that they're designed for. So there is a story map example that Night Lab has where they used, you don't have to use Google Maps for your map. So instead they used a uh, Hieronymus Bosch triptych as the map for, uh, in order to annotate and provide comments on the art. So if I jump through any of these comments, it brings me in and it has my sort of like uh, artistic critical interpretation of each of the pieces of this triptych and I can kind of walk around the map that way. So there's lots of really cool ways that you can use these tools beyond the way that maybe they were traditionally created for. Uh, there's lots of different examples in here, um, humanities related. And then on the right hand side are lesson plans and activities um, that includes uh, Zotero library. And I'm glad that Leah mentioned Zotero on uh, digital humanities education as well as a link to the LDL Collections as Data sample tutorials. Leah, do you want to talk a little bit about that, that project? Sure. Um, yeah, so this is a part of a grant project, um, the LDL as Data project. Um, so the, the purpose of this grant project is to uh, think about ways that we could responsibly, ethically provide the entirety of the LDL as data. Um, so that's something that is ongoing that we're continuing to work on. But these sample tutorials um, I made with some of my colleagues to demonstrate some ways that our current collections can be used as data. Um, so the, the first tutorial does something similar as what I showed you today, but looks at the Louisiana Civil Rights Movement Oral History Project. Um, 
And then in sample two is a demonstration of how you might use some of our geographic data to create a digital map using Google My Maps. And these are both um, made with undergraduates in mind. Um, these are projects that you could do in the classroom fairly, fairly easy, easily. Thanks, Leah. I just think that yeah. they're so cool and I wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Uh, in addition to all of those sort of uh, like example ideas of what an, an outcome might be, uh, what a deliverable might look like, we also have a tab for tools organized by sort of their purpose. So it includes the ones that we covered as well as lots of others, whether you want to uh, have students get used to web publishing using things like WordPress or Omeka or GitHub if you want for them to uh, historicize, use some kind of timeline or map or create data visualization, if you want them to get practice data wrangling, if you really wanna focus on textual analysis, um, media. I wanna highlight one of my favorites in here, which is augmented notes, which is specifically for annotating uh, measures of a score. Um, so really great stuff for all kinds of things, um, but that's just a handful of some of the tools that are out there. But if you have questions about how you might use this, or if you need uh, support kind of uh, holding your students' hands through the process, uh, we're happy to help. So our contact information is both on the front page here. So you can get whatever help you that you need in order to um, whether it's you want to some ideas to bounce off, is this possible? What can I do with some of these tools? Or if you need some more specialized training for it, let us know and we're happy to help. Leah, do you have something to add? I do not. It looks like I need to update my contact information on the website, but my email is lpowe17 at LSU. Um, and I've also done some of these um, workshops in classrooms when we were in classrooms or virtually. Uh, so you can you can reach out for direct instructional support as well. Well, cool. I'm gonna say thank you to everybody and I'm going to stop the share and stop the recording.